Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 112 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. My name is Dr. David C. Noe. I am here in Vomitorium South in the basement, the bunker of the Reformation Heritage Books Warehouse with my good friend and tremendous co-host, hmm. Dr. Jeffrey T. Winkle. How are you doing this afternoon, Jeff? I'm feeling all right. Uh, that, you know, that, some nasty weather about uh, oh, no. 10 feet above us no, right now. No, no. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that? Remember, no smarch comments this year. I, I can't help myself. I no? did, it was We've had such a mild winter, I take it, I'm taking it kind of personally. Okay, well, yeah. I can understand that, but it's not going to last. No, I hope not. No, it's just a... Um, I don't know. It's just a thin spittle on the landscape. It's soon to evaporate. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> I found myself muttering, though, that like the ten feet I had to walk from my my yes. car to the door, yes. being, being pelted by these these things coming at me Tiny sideways. Tiny little stinging pellets yes. of frozen precipitation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But aside, delightful. Aside from that, I'm doing just fine. Excellent. Yeah. How are you feeling today? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. It's uh, what well, it's mid February now. We got through the Valentine's blues. <laughs> Right? Did you do anything for Valentine's Day? No, my wife and I have an agreement that we don't. We, wow. We, yeah. So that is that's that's cold. That's I, cold school. It it, it it may be a little cold school. I I also I don't like this. I don't like the calendar. Mm. You know, telling me what I have to do. I, I, I can I, understand that. Right. So I mean, birthdays, anniversaries, yes. Yes. But, but don't be bossing me around in terms exactly. of now is the day I'm supposed to feel romantic. Right. Now I'm supposed to show my wife attention. Okay. Right. right. Exactly. It wasn't Saint Valentine himself, like brutally martyred and gutted. And I think that's right. correct. <laughs> It's so. a uh, it's a potential for lots of funny memes, right? Yes. As you've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with St. Patty's Day coming up, you're going to observe, right? Tr- um, trick yourself out in green and drink beer and so forth. Become Irish for the day. Yeah. yeah kiss me, I'm Irish. Right. right yeah. Blarney now, this. And I remember living in Chicago, you know, they, they dive the river green. Yeah. It's a, it's a big deal down there. Strange. Yeah. yeah. It is a little strange, right? But, so that's another holiday that you won't observe because... Uh, you don't want the calendar dictating. I know. Well, it's. I find Valentine's Day a, a bossier holiday. Mm. It comes with kind of this obligation. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um. So, and it just seems kind of manufactured and and uh, and and silly. Yeah. Mrs. Noe said to me, "You should see the grocery store today. Lots of men scrambling in by the dozens to buy flowers." Yeah. And you know, she meant it as a joke, and so I was about to laugh, but then I had that moment's hesitation of, <laughs> "Wait a minute." <laughs> Is there some communication here I'm missing? So you, know, you and scan, scan. You and Mrs. Noe don't have a, an agreement like uh, like nah, Beck and I do. No, nah. no, no. It's it's more hit and miss. Gotcha. Right. Probably more miss right. than anything. But man, I've I've been that guy scrambling. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy again. Forty-five dollars for one rose. I'll take it. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. They have you over a barrel. That's correct. Right, just desperation <laughs> uh, just sinks in at that point. Yeah. So, so what, they, what are you talking about? What are we talking about today? Yeah. We're, actually, we're, we're talking. We're talking. Actually, talking about you today. Yeah, to we? some extent. Right. So I know you don't like. You don't like talking about yourself. Well, well you just finished. Maybe I pretend not to like talking about myself. Okay. I don't know. But you just finished a monumental project. I did. Uh, you are translating um, uh, the works of Sam, one Samuel Rutherford. Right? right. Now, is was it one particular work? Was it a combination of works? Or? Yeah, it was his Examen Arminianisme. Okay. A careful review of Arminianism. Mm. That's the working title. And uh, I'm eager to talk about the man, first of all, yeah. Sa- Sammy Rutherford, the man a little bit. We'll give some biography and background. We'll talk about the work itself, the EA. Uh, and then if time allows, and if you can use uh, your typical interviewing magic to pull some details out of me, we can talk about the process of translation. All right. And uh, I don't want to give away the farm, you know, in terms mm-hmm. of... Uh, all those folks out there who want to be translators, I got to keep some secrets close to the. Uh, well, of course, exactly. Because I'm sure everybody's lining up for <laughs> this kind of thing. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit too. Excellent. Well, I got to say, I, you know, before um, before this show, I, I did some show prep and I did some yeah. reading about about Sammy, and he was not somebody I was familiar with at right. all. But um, I was struck by what a uh, a colorful and eventful life he led. Yeah, he really did. I was prepared for. Uh, I was actually. I, I, didn't, I was prepared for a snoozer. <laughs> and, uh, another Scottish Presbyterian. Yeah. And, well, wait uh, a minute. How what? many have we covered? I, I think this is the first one. We, no, I'm not talking about the show. I'm just, oh, oh, in my oh, experience, okay. the Scottish Presbyterians I've met and encountered both living and dead. Yeah. Okay, nah, I mean, they're dowdy. They're a little bit dowdy. So yes. I was expecting some dowdiness, but there's there's very little dowdiness here. No, there's there's a lot of intense. 
activity and more than a little bit of controversy. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, good stuff. We covered William Perkins before, who's an English Calvinist. I uh, remember that. Way back when. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the best titles I've, you know, you've ever come up with, Cranks for the Memories. Oh, yeah. Talked about his uh, memory disputes. It's episode 16 or 18. Way back. Yeah, we talked yep. about uh, Daniel Heinzius, uh, another gentleman from this era. Mm-hmm. Can't You can't Dutch this. He was he was a Dutchman himself, right? That's correct. Yeah, he right. was at the Synod of Dort. He was the secretary. Okay. A brilliant polymath and Latinist. So there's another guy from 17th century. We got one 16th, a couple 17th. Mm-hmm. And uh, we may do more of this uh, because... What is our what is our brief here at the Ad Nauseum podcast? How, what is our you know method of selection or criteria? Well, it's well, it's it's really anything having to do with the classical world from its beginnings to up till up to the present day. That's correct. Right. To yesterday, even we have the the broadest of, of uh, parentheses. That's very very convenient for us. It is. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but this but um those Latin writers of the 16th right. 17th century it's kind of your your sweet spot right now it has that, become that yeah it's not how it started but it has become that okay and uh, i'd like to get into that too but we have to start with no shout out no shout out but okay. something almost as good a quarter that again them oh just just one uh, uh just one okay yeah, why do you say it like that <laughs> well, yeah. what is our this will cheer a quarter again them always cheers me up yeah okay so, so what do we got what, all right so back in episode 110 two episodes ago we were talking about the midnight raid of Nisus and Euryalus. Yeah. And we made some passing reference to the story of the conflict between King David and King Saul. Right. So uh, David was not yet king, though he was anointed such. And a very careful listener um, said, first of all, great episode. We loved it. Secondly, Uh you got some details wrong. Uh Uh-oh, what do we do? She she was very kind. She was very gracious. But, you know, it it bugs me because I got to be more responsible than this. And I'm, I'm the one who trotted it out. So... It's 1 Samuel chapter 24. Okay. And so uh, here's how it goes. Um, After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Oh, okay. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there. Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscience stricken. Okay. So I think as we told the story, I think I was, uh, you know, I I lured you into this. It's my fault. Uh, But I think I was conflating this with another incident in which one of David's men offered to go uh, steal Saul's water jug or something like that. Oh, okay. Or or to get some, I'm here, I'm going to have to have another corrigendum. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I to go draw some water, right? Okay, okay. And I was okay. conflating those two episodes, and uh, it is reminiscent of the Midnight Raid of Nisus and Euryalus, mm-hmm. but not identical. So uh, there's the corrigendum. I uh, hope you're listening. You know who you are. Yeah. Uh, we try to do right by this. Well, we, we've got some careful listeners there. Yeah, that, we do. That, that, uh, keep keep us that. on our toes. That's good. Almost like fact checkers, except we don't pay them. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> even better. Yeah. All right. So the okay. first opening quote. Yes. I, lo- I love this one. This is from H.L. Mencken. Mm-hmm. H.L. Mencken, a uh, Baltimore aristocrat and a newspaper man, just incredible uh, worker of words, um, 1880 to 1956. Those are his dates. And he said, since this is our subject today, the Puritans, here's his definition of Puritanism. It is the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. <laughs> That's great. So that is everyone's uh, <laughs> general impression of the Puritans. Right. Uh, forged primarily by one uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne mm. and the Scarlet Letter. Yes, of course. Right. right. The, the Puritans apparently were, you know, psychologically um, suppressed, repressed. They kept all their emotions at bay. That's, right. That's the Hawthorne take. They were cruel and vindictive. They didn't like fun or sensuality or anything. They took dowdiness to, to, to the next correct. level, right? Yeah. right. <laughs> Hyper dowdy. Right. Uh, but not accurate. No, no, not accurate. Really, we're gonna, we're gonna, are we gonna get some uh, counter arguments um, against it? Maybe today? not so much, okay. but just as a general, as a general observation, Mencken said this in humor, right? Do you know the context? I've seen that quote a lot. Do you know the context of it? <laughs> no, or, okay. I don't. All right. yeah. No, I'm just curious. It's very funny. He had a way with words. That guy. Yeah. Uh, an expert in Nietzsche, actually, Mencken was. He really? was. Mm-hmm. Wow. But the Puritans, uh, they're not like that. Okay. They had lots of fun, right? Uh, the name Puritan was a, a name given to them by their opponents mm. uh, because um, everyone who was Protestant in England at the time was interested in reforming the church to some extent, right after Henry VIII brought in the Reformation and then 
His daughter Elizabeth reigned for a long time. But people had different levels of comfort with the amount of reformation that they wanted. Mm. And those who wanted a full-on reformation, get rid of all the old rituals and so forth, yeah. c- clean out the cathedrals, uh, they were in a pejorative way called Puritans. Interesting. So that, that was a, that's, and that's the name that stuck. That's the name that stuck. Huh. It began as a, it, you know, a term of reproach. Right. And it eventually became their title. It reminds so. me of, uh, so you know, Mormons don't like to be called Mormons. No. They want to be called uh, Latter-day Saints, That's right? That's right. Did, did the Puritans have a, the, so, no, don't call us Puritans, call us this. Did they no, have they a, call themselves the Reformed. The Reformed, or okay. Formati, or they just called themselves Fideles, the faithful, or, okay. or Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's funny how the first person to label something in, in some memorable fashion, they win. Yeah, right. If, it's if you, true. If you can label your opponent, now, you can, you can parry that thrust by turning... Uh, something that's meant as an insult into a compliment. Mm-hmm. And I think the Puritans succeeded in that. But originally it was uh, a term of derision. Yeah. Nothing's ever good enough for you. Nothing's ever pure enough. Right. Well, I, well, I think even still you hear the uh, the adjective puritanical. It's, it's well, rarely complimentary, right? No, no that's right. <laughs> you yeah. got that right. Now it looks like we have a second opening quote as well. Yes, you we want to share that with us? Yes, I would like to. So this is from uh, a book by one Robert C. Sturdy. It's called Freedom from Fatalism, Samuel Rutherford's Doctrine of Divine Providence. It was published by Vandenhoek and Ruprecht, the Dutch publishers, in uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. And it's a poem uh, that is associated with Rutherford's tomb. So here is the poem as it goes. It's an inscription taken from Rutherford's tombstone in the churchyard at St. Andrew's Cathedral in Scotland. Hmm. What tongue or pen or skill of men can famous Rutherford commend? His learning justly raised his fame. True godliness adorned his name. He did converse with things above, acquainted with Emmanuel's love. Most orthodox he was and sound, and many errors did confound. For Zion's king and Zion's cause and Scotland's covenantal laws, most constantly he did contend until his time was at an end. Then he won to the full fruition of that which he had seen in vision." Interesting. Yeah. My first thought is that that's got to be a fairly large tombstone. Yes, that's my thought that's too. Large, my second epitaph. thought is uh, maybe this guy who wrote this epigraph, uh, epitaph, yeah. excuse me, could write some limericks for us for the uh, the ad read. He's got he's got the rhyme. He's got the rhythm. Yeah. My final thought was the last two lines, not as successful as the rest. Different number of syllables, and he's rhyming fruition and vision. That's that's a tough one. That's it's a, a challenge. That's a, and that's kind of a uh, that's not a that's kind of a lame way to end. You think so? so? If you're gonna if you're gonna have a, a, a an off rhyme, I, I would say put it earlier. Front load it. That's true. <laughs> but the sentiment in the last two lines, he won to the full fruition, the full enjoyment of that which he had seen in vision. Ah, okay. So that's the sentiment is nice. Yes. Uh, but I guess everyone's a critic, including us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now I have to ask. Um, yes. uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It wasn't that long ago that you were in Scotland. Right? Yes, yes, that's right. Did you visit his tomb? Well, it. You know how time flies. Yes. We winkle as we age. It was uh, January of 18, so it's five years now. Oh, man. Okay. So was, yeah. Right. And was this before he was kind of on your radar? No, he was on oh. my radar, but I wasn't near to being finished with this important work. Gotcha. And uh, so I wanted to go to Anwith, which is where there's a tall plinth, a monument uh, in his honor. That's where he was pastor for about seven years. Didn't make it there. Mm, okay. Uh, also didn't make it out to uh, St. Andrews because it was just the wrong time to drive there in January. Is it kind of nasty and rainy? Yes, and, yeah. and we didn't have our own vehicle, my son and I. So we saw Edinburgh, Yeah, and that's where he was. And so someday I'd like to go back in the summer and see some of these places. Yeah, without a because doubt. Because I think it'd be much nicer. All right. Well, All right. Sh- Should we start a bit with uh, some, bi- some biography? Let's do that. All right. Where, yeah. where do, should we start? With, I think we should begin at the beginning. Start uh, with his birth? Yeah. Well, like many of us, he was born at a very young age. <laughs> In uh, the year 1600, in the parish of Nisbet, in the county of Roxborough. Mm-hmm. Those names mean anything to no, you? No, Roxborough. I, mean, I, I enjoy the name. It means <laughs> nothing to me. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't put Nisbet on the map. So he was Scottish, and we'll have to be careful for our Scottish listeners not to try any Scottish accents. We got taken to task for that. As we've done okay. in the past. I'll do my best to leave it alone. Right. So right. his dates are 1600. 1600 was when he was born. That's an easy one to remember. To 1661. Mm-hmm. So he lived for 61 years. And throughout, we're going to rely on uh, the work of three individuals primarily. And that is uh, the aforementioned Robert C. Sturdy, uh, a gentleman named Guy Richard. Guy Richard, who wrote a book called The Supremacy of God and the Theology of Samuel Rutherford. Uh, and an Englishman named John Coffey, 
who is a, a world expert on the Puritans and on Rutherford in particular. All right. So those three books, uh, you know, if, if anything sounds like a quotation, just in the in the interest of being honest and no plagiarism, mm -hmm. you can you can reliably count on it coming from one of these individuals. Excellent. So this is not original research. You know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. That's Excellent. the idea. All right. Before we get into more details about Rutherford, yes. I, have, I have a more kind of broader historical okay. cultural question for you, because this is an era and an area that I don't know a lot about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember a uh, number of years, 20 years ago, I was at a conference at the University of Edinburgh mm. and, 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 and loved it. They really enjoyed it. And um I remember meeting some people and they asked me where I was from at this time. I was teaching at the, the college that shall not be named. Right. And um, I told them the name of the college. I said, oh, well, says, that's a name that will be very well received around here. Yes. And so, and I didn't realize of just of what kind of a stronghold of the Reformation Scotland was. Yes. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, how did that come to oh, be? Oh, sure. I got to be very brief here because I, I didn't prepare for this in particular, uh, this question in particular. So I'm going to be brief and try to be concise. Uh, John Knox mm -hmm. and, a, and a number of other uh, refugees from Scotland and the British Islands came to Geneva and studied with Calvin. And then they went back to their home country. Knox in particular went back to Scotland with a man named uh, George Wishart, I think his name is, and began the process of seeking to reform Scotland and uh, purge it of uh, Roman Catholicism as they saw it and introduce uh, pure Reformed biblical worship. Interesting. And the Scottish, in some ways, the Reformed faith was seemed to be really ideal for them. You know, some of the, um, the, the severity of the Protestant aesthetic, the simplicity, uh, it didn't win over all of Scottish society. Yeah. But there was a time when it was uh, very much in the ascendant. Yeah. In, in a way that it never succeeded in England. Now, I was just going to say that my sense is that in England, that the, you don't see the same kind of roots taking... Uh, to, no. Uh, There's much, down, more, right? much more strife, much more conflict in England. And I think part of it is the Scots were forming a national identity uh, against the English. Yeah. So I don't want to get too far afield here you right. know, and outrun my coverage in terms of my expertise. Um, but I think what I've said is accurate. Okay. And just one more thing. I th I, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you don't see the kind of strife like between the Anglicans and Catholics uh, in Scotland like you do in England. Is that true? Is, is it generally true? Okay. But there's plenty of strife within Scotland over those who did not want to reform. They wanted to hold on to the Roman Catholic traditions okay. that they had held for centuries. Uh, and those who did want to reform and clean out, you know, the cathedrals and there's an iconoclastic impulse. Hmm. There's lots of that conflict. But the Church of England, you know, was associated with the English aristocracy. Right. And that was a third way that uh, many others were trying to, to invent between what they saw as the two extremes of Romanism and um, Reform faith. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so yeah. Anglicanism never had that kind of foothold right. uh, in the North. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, excellent. Oh, so let's uh, continue with the biography. So yes. Where, so where do we so go um, schooling began perhaps at the age of eight or nine at a place called Jedburg. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a four-mile walk. Uphill so, both ways. Yeah. So <laughs> four miles to school, he would have been, uh, we don't really know, he'd have been seven or eight years old perhaps. Wow. And the uh, education was Latin. Just Latin. Just Latin. But basically just lots and lots and lots of Latin. Okay. Uh, from there, he went to the University of Edinburgh in 1617. And the, um, the curriculum was divided up into four years. Uh, there were the first years, the Bajan year, B-A-J-A-N. What does that mean? Do I don't know. Bajan. And I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, Bajan. There you go. <laughs> That's what the first year was called. Yes. Okay. And then right. the second one was the semi bajan year. All right. And then there was the baccalaureate year and then the magistrand year, the fourth one. Okay. At which point the pupil was required to do some instruction. Oh, wow. And uh, as Sturdy makes evident in his work, um, it was still a time when there wasn't a high degree of um, specialization among the faculty. So it was kind of like the St. John's College in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and I think there's one in New Mexico. Is that the, the, the great books curriculum? Yes. Okay, yeah. Where the professor is expected to teach everything. Yeah. There isn't a high degree of specialization. Uh, and so at the University of Edinburgh, you would have a, an instructor who would teach you Greek, Latin, mathematics geography, a variety of things. Yeah, okay. And, you know, it has some, I think that that system has some things to recommend it, especially at the lower levels. Yeah. Uh, at the higher levels, quickly, uh, you know, run out of your depth, I would say, in terms of expertise. But one of the things that it has to recommend it is that it gives the student a model of someone who has broad interest and curiosity. 
And so there's that bond of friendship that forms if you're not changing teachers constantly. Yeah. And I think that that can make a student more motivated uh, to succeed. Yeah. 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 I can see that. I can definitely see the, the allure of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to read a little quote here from a sturdy on uh, page 40. This would be the second year. In his semi bayesian year, Rutherford began his study of Aristotle under the expert instruction of Andrew Young. The latter half of the year was spent in the Organon, studying De Interpretatione, the Prior Analytica, Topica, and De Sophisticis Elenchis. Porphyry's commentary upon De Interpretatione was also employed. In his bachelor year, his third year, Rutherford read the Posterior Analytica and the Ethica Nicomachia, Nicomachean Ethics. He also began a study of Hebrew grammar. In his last year, the Magistrand year, Rutherford read more Aristotle, which included De Caelo, De Generatione et Corruptione, Meteorologica, and De Anima. So heavy Aristotle. Now, do we know from his biography that um, he went off to, to, to university with the goal of becoming a pastor, or was that just incidental? That's a great question. Do we, do we know? No. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm saying we do seem to know, based on the record that we have, the pastoral ministry was not at all on his radar at that point. Okay. Um, now, you know, a man who was born to parents who could afford an education, they typically had three or four potential career paths uh, marked out. And this goes back long before the Reformation. This would include um, medicine, um, you know, the clergy, law, uh, law, and then some, some teaching or letters, mm -hmm. right? Those were the typical four that were open to you if your parents could afford to teach you Latin. Um, but it doesn't seem like he had any interest in uh, being a pastor at this point. Okay, okay. Now, in terms of um, like spoken Latin at this point, is it uh, is has Latin by this point become kind of a strictly literary language? Or no, no, it, it's still still definitely spoken. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, still definitely spoken. So, in terms of his is uh, what he was learning at school, what was the content? Right. Well, in addition to Aristotle, uh, we have this really nice quote from Sturdy once again talking about the classicism of his education. This is page 48, quote, Other classical authors used by Rutherford include Cicero, Tacitus, Plutarch, Xenophon, Sallust, Herodotus, Seneca, and Homer. In regard to these sources, Tacitus, Plutarch, Xenophon, Sallust, Herodotus, and Homer are used to supply historical example. examples. Cicero and Seneca's relationship to Rutherford's writing is more complex. Cicero generally receives negative treatment for his refutation of the Stoics. Following Augustine, Cicero, uh, Rutherford argued that Cicero's attempt to reign in the excess of the Stoics went too far and destroyed any meaningful understanding of God's providence. This defense of the Stoics found in the Disputatio, along with certain positive references found in Rutherford's letters and other writings, has led John Coffey to argue for a Stoic trait in Rutherford. Which authors, then, just to kind of sum that up, right. do we see kind of the most, so is it Ciceronian influence on, on Rutherford that is kind of the most most obvious? Or Well, anyone who was learning to read and write Latin would rely upon Cicero. Oh, right, of course, right. Uh, but having translated now 800 pages of this guy, yeah. it is not Ciceronian. <laughs> we can right. talk about that right. and get me all wound up, exactly. let me tell you. And you need to say this as someone who knows a lot about Cicero. So. Well, who at least admires him a lot. Okay, gotcha, so. okay. Um, so it was a standard, you know, the point of the quote is there's a, there's a standard menu of classical authors mm -hmm. and Rutherford uh, sampled from all of them deeply, even as quite a young man. So this is before he was 17 years old. Yeah. Right. It's incredible. Yep. So in 1621, now he's 21 years old, he became a candidate for the newly created chair of humanities at the University of Edinburgh. Okay. So he's, he's finished four years of education. He could now candidate for this chair. Uh, new, new appointment, new chair in humanities. This is part of the general reform. You know, the Renaissance uh, got this far north pretty late, but it eventually got here. And now it's time to not just teach theology, but to teach letters, you know, yeah. uh, pagan literature. And so they're going to endow a chair. Rutherford's a candidate to hold that chair. Now, of course, at age 21, uh, you know, going after a position like this strikes me, of course, as shockingly young. Yes. Would it have been back then? No. Okay. No, I mean, he was precocious. He was prodigious mm -hmm. in his learning. He did not make mistakes in Latin in school, according to the biographers. He was very sharp. Uh, so it's a little young, but you have to remember that they didn't have a wide variety of subjects, and all they did was study, really. Yeah. And so it's not especially young uh, for such an appointment. But he didn't get it. And oh. the reason is scandal. 
Oh, finally the story gets a little juicy, right? <laughs> Did you come across this uh, in some of your preliminary research? I, I, I noticed there were a few places that he was kind of gotten some hot water. So, right. Uh, um, this is the first one. What, yes. So what happened here? Well, so this is uh, Robert Sturdy again, page 51. The position, you know, the chair of humanity, was initially intended for training in law. Though it seems one of the candidates performed better, the judge's knowledge of Rutherford, his virtuous disposition, quote, and eminent abilities of mind won them over. Rutherford was initially awarded the position. Unfortunately, he held his professorship for less than two years. Uh -oh. Crawford, one of the biographers, simply states that, quote, having given some scandal in his marriage, Rutherford was, quote, forced to demit his charge. So there are two views regarding the scandal. The first is that of John Adamson, who related the charge against Rutherford that he had, quote, fallen in fornication. The scandal of sex outside of the bonds of marriage in the strict Presbyterian community of 17th century Edinburgh would be more than enough grounds for dismissal and potentially worse, ah. as you can imagine. Uh, the second view held by Murray, one of his 19th century biographers, and many of Rutherford's admirers, is that some indiscretion short of fornication took place. To save the university's reputation from an investigation, which would have been prolonged and public, Rutherford resigned. I see, yeah. The other biographers of Rutherford simply dismissed the charges outright. Murray takes some pains to establish his case. He notes that Rutherford's enemies of which were many by the end of his life, never brought up this embarrassing moment in their polemics. Hmm. Also, the university granted Rutherford a, quote, an honest gratification at his dismission. Uh, shortly after his demission, he was admitted to theological training and ordained into the ministry. Many years later, the same Presbytery of Edinburgh would have known of his demission, elect, who would have known of his demission, elected him to serve as a minister in the city. Okay, so that all seems to argue that this, this is kind of back and forth. This is a nothing burger. Yes, yeah. that, right. However... That's the 19th century biographer, um, Murray. Now we get John Coffey, uh, a man with whom I've had some correspondence. I haven't met him. Mm -hmm. We were going to go to Anworth together and look at some things. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, Coffey has evaluated Murray's defense and found it wanting. He notes that the committee appointed to investigate the scandal appointed a successor to Rutherford, uh, suggesting a scandal did occur. He also notes that Adamson, who leveled the charge of fornication against Rutherford, actually sat on commissions with him in the 1640s which would be 15 years later, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. It is hard to imagine, here's a really telling quote, it is hard to imagine that Rutherford would be willing to serve on a commission with a man who had deliberately and falsely accused him of fornication. Ah. Third, uh, contra to Murray, that's the 19th century biographer, Rutherford's enemies did use this incident against him late in his life, describing him as, quote, loose in his youth. Okay, so that that points to that because something did happen. Now I did read that the the woman in, involved in this did become his wife. Yes, Is that right? a okay. woman named Euphem Hamilton. Euphem. Yep, Euphem. E U P H A M, which means good name, good reputation. Yeah, uh, he he did. Uh, according to St uh, Sturdy Rutherford, did have a child with Euphem Hamilton. If he had married her nine months previously, it is hard to conceive of how such a charge as fornication would have stuck. Finally, Coffee notes that Rutherford makes frequent mention of the sins of his youth which Coffee takes to refer to the Edinburgh scandal. Okay. So the weight of the evidence, says Sturdy, seems to rest with Adamson and Coffee. But he seems to have kind of come back fairly, did. Quick, fairly quickly from that. Yes, right? that, that's what's incredible. Yeah. Uh, he left at that point in academic career. It's interesting that this charge of fornication uh, lost him his position that he held for two years in this chair of humanities, but he went right from this into the study of theology, Yeah. Uh, where he stayed for the next six years or so. And so uh, he completed his theological training in 1627, so that's six years later, and then he became a minister at Anwith. So in some way, during that time period, his character was rehabilitated, his yeah. reputation was rehabilitated enough for him to become uh, a pastor of the church uh, in the small town of Anwith in right. Scotland. Now, where is Anwith? Right. Well, it's way off to the southwest, way far away from Edinburgh, uh, almost on the border with England. Um, near Dumfries, west of Dumfries. Close to Hadrian's Wall? Mm, or quite a way south of there. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Let's see. No. Uh, if if uh, Here, I'm looking at the map. If you extend the western end, the southwestern end of Hadrian's Wall, and you go straight west there, you're going to hit Anwith. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So he goes off and he becomes pastor there. All right. And um, apparently he was very, very diligent. He would wake at 3 a.m. for his studies. He preached often, usually twice on Sunday. He'd go door to door, catechizing uh, the children and the adults, uh, you know, many of whom could not read. So he wrote a catechism. 
and he asked them questions about the scriptures and their faith, visiting the sick, uh, generally performing well in that capacity. So it sounds like he, he, whatever indiscretion there was, he's making up for it here. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Right. Then he falls afoul of the political authorities. He can't see out of trouble. What's yeah. with this guy? Yeah. Well, he was a temperamental fellow, mm-hmm. uh, zealous. He offended the king and was uh, relieved of his charge at Anwith and committed to house arrest in Aberdeen. So this would be King Charles II, I believe. Yes, right? that's yes. right. Okay. Now, why would that, what, was, what was Chuck upset about? Uh, he had written a number of scandalous treatises and letters uh, criticizing um, the king's willingness to honor the covenant and so forth made with Scotland, mm-hmm. uh, criticizing his commitment to reform and um, that it wasn't going far enough. Now, he was also critical of the notion of divine right of kings and wrote about this later, right? Yes, in the Lakes Rakes, which I think came out in 1644. So he was already kind of predisposed to to, uh, not like the royalty, right? Right, primarily not because he had any um, beef or charge with uh, monarchy in particular, but because the monarch was not reforming the church according to the scriptures. Oh, okay, okay. As Rutherford and many other so-called non-conforming churchmen, um, you know, they were supposed to follow some of the rules of... Um, the English church as instituted by the king, mm-hmm. and they were not doing so. And so he was placed under house arrest in Aberdeen, where he was for two or three years. Uh, then he was relieved of that, and he went to the University of St. Andrews, St. Mary's College in 1639. So he comes back again. He bounces back. Yes. Yeah. Each time yeah. he manages to bounce back. Absolutely. All right. Perhaps the most uh, important moment in his life was when he became a commissioner at the Westminster Assembly. And this is really where, you know, my interest and work on his work uh, comes in. So what does that mean to be a commissioner at the Westminster Assembly? Right. Well, I'm going to read a little bit here of Sturdy, page 65. The English Parliament's Assembly. Now, the English Parliament was at odds with the king and eventually at war with the king. But the English Parliament's Assembly had been called earlier in 1643 to produce three things. A confession of faith, a form of church government, and a directory of worship. And as as a fourth addendum to that, a directory for catechizing. So the uh, Scots were invited to send commissioners or delegates to this assembly. They would meet in London at Westminster Abbey in the Jerusalem Chamber. And over the course of several years, being divided up into committees, they would hammer out uh, these different documents, which were intended to be a guide to all Reformed churches Hmm. uh, under the British in the British realm. Oh, okay. And, and so uh, Rutherford was chosen to yes. be that commissioner. He was one of five one Scots. Of five. Okay. Uh, the others were Alexander Henderson, Robert Douglas, Robert Bailey, and George Gillespie. Okay. And uh, Rutherford kind of began, uh, became the leader of that group by virtue of his learning and eloquence and intelligence and so forth. And um, the Scots, though, though there were only five of them, had kind of an outsized influence on the rest of the assembly. Hmm. Okay. And because of their work, which lasted for several years, they issued the Westminster Standards. So in your tradition, you've got the three forms of unity, the Belgic Confession, the Canons of Dort, Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, the Presbyterian tradition has the Westminster Standards, okay. which is the Confession and the two Catechisms. Okay. So of all the men who were there at this event, they wrote volumes, volumes of uh, theology in Latin, you know, enough to fill this room and more. Hmm. Um, 90% of which has never been translated. Wow. And so then I became a part of this project to translate some of these works from Latin into English for the first time. And uh, Rutherford is one of the biggest names. Okay. And so that's how I kind of got launched into that. So just a couple more things about the man Rutherford, and then we probably will have uh, summed up his life adequately for our purposes. Mm -hmm. Um, He at one point received an invitation to teach Reformed theology in the Netherlands. Uh, because he had become quite famous now for his works, his writing. Uh, He's most famous for his letters. His letters went through multiple dozens of printings in multiple languages. These are letters which he wrote to Christ and to other people. Some of them are um, very, very amorous, uh, almost in a way that's hard to explain the way he expresses his love for Christ. It's almost like a type of medieval devotion that you would read from nuns and so forth. All these in Latin as well? No, these are largely in English. Okay. Um, Very, very popular. In fact, if I can quote from Sturdy here again, this time from page 18, he says, quote, As Coffee notes, Rutherford's posthumous reputation rests almost entirely upon his famous pastoral letters. His letters have seen over 80 editions in English. 
Wow. And over 15 editions in Dutch. They have also appeared in French, German, and Gaelic. A contemporary of Rutherford, the English nonconformist minister Richard Baxter, described Rutherford's collection of pastoral letters as second only to the Bible. The Church of England priest and leader within the Methodist movement, Charles Wesley, commended the letters for the vein of piety, trust in God, and holy zeal which runs through them. The English Baptist Charles Spurgeon declared the letters to be, quote, the nearest thing to inspiration which can be found in all the writings of mere men. That's incredibly high praise. It is. <laughs> yeah. Finally, this last one. The letters are marked with a style Alexander White, moderator of the General Assembly to the Free Church of Scotland, described as seraphic. My goodness. Yeah. I've never read them, which is surprising, uh, but I've never read them. Have you ever read any of Rutherford's letters? Never heard of them. Yeah. Never, no. Very, very popular. Filled with expressions of love and a deep searching of the soul. Uh, really puts, um, you know, puts to rest the notion that the Puritans were never happy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because this is an expression of, uh, as I understand from secondhand knowledge, uh, elevated love toward God and the development of love toward neighbor. So that's where he became really famous Okay. in, in that kind of writing. He declined the invitation uh, to teach in the Netherlands because he said that his own country had such need of reform that um, from interests of patriotism, he did not feel like he could uh, leave his own country. Okay, all right. Now, we're get, are we getting towards the end of his life here? Yes. Or, okay. Yep, so he died in 1661. And let me just give you uh, what will probably be the last quote from our stout friend here, Robert C. Sturdy. Did you get that little pun there? The stout. I like it. Okay. So this is from page 72. On March 8, 1661, Rutherford issued his last will and testimony, quote, I shall shine, he said to his friends shortly before his death. I shall shine. I shall see him as he is. I shall see him reign. Let my Lord's name be exalted, he said, quote, and if he will, let my name be grinded to pieces that he may be all in all. If he should slay me 10,000 times, 10,000 I'll trust. Rutherford died on March 29, 1661. Now, as I understand it, he died um, amidst another one of these scandals. The, the, That's right. The Lex Rex had got him into trouble. He was being brought up on charges of treason. That's right. But he died before before he could be brought before Parliament, right? Yes, he yep. was deprived of his position, again to quote uh, Sturdy, hmm. deprived of his position at the university as well as a stipend and confined to his house, so house arrest. He was summoned to appear before Parliament for charges of treason. Serious illness prevented him. So isn't that interesting? Yeah. Died, I mean, I don't know. How would you want to go? Would you rather be tried for treason and uh, go to the London Tower or I mean, something? I'd, I'd rather die and maybe maybe yeah. miss that part of the, of the deal. <laughs> but I mean, he, what, what a life. I mean, he kind of rode this wave of, you know, academic and pastoral success. Yeah, he did. And, and, and admiration, but then he kind of in and out of these these strange scandals that That's right. um, robbed him of things and then he bounces back. It's, right. It's and really, died rather young. Yes. Right? 61 years old. Right, uh, you're you're cresting um, fifty two ish something yeah. something like that. Sixty one in the seventeenth century was that's that's not a bad stretch. That's a pretty it? good run. Okay, that's a pretty good run. Lots of people live longer. Yeah. Um, some of those you know some of those life averages take into account infant mortality. So right. oh right, of course. If you yeah. could get past five, you know you might live a long you time. Got a, you got a shot, right? Right, but it was a full life for yeah. sure. Well, speaking of having a pretty good run, yes, it's time for the ads. This episode of Odd Nauseam is brought to you by the good folks at Hackett Publishing. All right. I'm, I was just reading in my class this morning um, some Lombardo. Yes. And I had a student come up and said, you know, we're, we're reading the Odyssey, Professor Winkle. Uh, who would you recommend for the Iliad? And I right. Said, well, about Mr. Lombardo again. Yes. And I said, it's, a, it's, an affordable, it's an affordable translation. It's a great translation. And she was saying, she was saying to me this morning, um, you know, I was prepared to hate this. She said, I, re what? I read the Odyssey. In ninth grade, and so whatever translation we used, I found it. I was like pounding my head against the wall, mm. and and she says I was floored by how readable Lombardo's translation was. And wow. so, she, so I I had the the delight to inform her that he also translated the Iliad, yeah. and both of those texts are published by Hackett Publishing. Right. Yep. So this is a actual testimony. Yes. From a young undergrad in the trenches. Yeah, just like three hours ago. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, confronting one of the great works of Western literature and is going to love it mm -hmm. because of this great translator. Yes, exactly. Right. Phenomenal. And uh, it's interesting in this episode, because we're talking about translating. Right. And I mean, that's so important. A translation 
can it can be an invitation or it can be a big brick wall. That's an excellent point. It, it makes it break. So some things that you encounter, you know, you might never go back to it if your first experience is bitter. That's right. So Hackett Publishing, um, they've got a great reputation for um, a, a wide variety of translations. Classics, right? Right. South American studies, Asian studies, politics, economics, you name it. History, religion. Uh, they can do it. Yeah. So do yourself a favor. Go to HackettPublishing.com. That's H-A-C-K-E-T-T Publishing.com. Scroll through their tremendous catalog. They've been in business for 51 years now. That's right. That's yes. right. Yeah. And with their with their um, their home offices in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Indianapolis, um, they just keep that fire a burning. They do. Yep. And we're very grateful to them yep. uh, for their generous and long term support of this podcast. And if you, dear listener, you like uh, this podcast and you want to score yourself some good volumes uh, on which to feast. Again, go to HackettPublishing.com, mm -hmm. scroll through, pick out what you like, drop them in your little grocery satchel, yep. and then, Jeff, what do they need to do? Then they type in the coupon code, which I believe is AN2023. 2023. And that will get them uh, two wonderful things, 20% off your entire order and free shipping. Check it out. This episode of Ad Nauseum is also brought to you by Racial Coffee. You're beginning a new year. We're now in the second month of that year at Ratio, and I have to ask you, dear listener, what kind of swill are you imbibing? Seriously. Yes. What are you doing with that swill? Right. Come on. <laughs> Is it bilge water? Is it the kind of thing when you step into a small rowboat, it seeps up around your ankles? <laughs> Is that really what you want? Is that the kind of coffee you want to put into your body? Yeah. Is it something that, that at best could be described as brackish? That's correct. Right? Yeah. At best. So if that's your predicament, um, let us give you some good advice here. Jeff, what, what do you think folks ought to do? Well, I think they ought to um, do themselves a favor and invest in one of these wonderful machines, the Ratio 6 or the Ratio 8. I've had them both. They're both wonderful. Um these are, as we, we often say on this podcast, this is, these are not machines you're going to have on your counter for like three months and no. sputter out and die. Right. These things are built to last, um, built to be passed down to your, to your children's children. Right. Um, One of those old machines that you think, you know, it's all plastic. I should probably recycle it, but I hate it so much for the way it's treated me. I just want to run over it with my vehicle. Exactly. Beat it with a baseball bat. Exactly. Like scene from Office Space. That's yeah. not what's going to happen with the Ratio 6 or the 8. No. They are very pleasing aesthetically. They are. And they make a go cup of Joe, don't they? That's this <laughs> this they do. Yeah. And it's not just about the Joe. It's the, it's the ex, it's the experience of yeah. of, uh, of 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 brewing it, of kind of watching what this machine can do. Um, yep. Just uh, it's an attractive work of art on your counter. Can't yes. say enough about it. Yeah, just this morning. Morning. I was, you know, getting ready to go to work to teach a little bit of Greek, teach a little bit of Latin, so forth at the seminary. And I thought, I don't really have time to use my ratio. I'll just pick up something there. And that no, you you, you no, didn't. No, right? okay. I'm going to regret it. Yes. So you know, I did the I did the grind. I put everything in. I pushed the one button. You know, I went out and uh, came back, and in a very short amount of time, it was ready. It, it was, was great. Ready. And of right. course, I didn't regret it. Of course, you didn't regret it. I'm, no. I, 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 You're proud of me now. I'm very proud that you made that decision. That's right. So, listeners. Um, if you want one of these wonderful machines, go to ratiocoffee.com, R-A-T-I-O coffee.com. Pick the machine that you want. Um, and uh, what coupon code should they use? They need to use A-N ad nauseum, C-O coffee, A-N-C-O, B as in bravado. Yes. B4. B4. So A-N-C-O, B4, and that will get them uh, 15 15% 15. 15 off your entire order. Yeah, this is a purchase you will not regret. All right, Dave. So as we get back into it, we're going to turn to your translation right. um, of this work of Rutherford's. And so I think the audience would be very interested to know is how does a project even like this come together? How does it come on your radar? Right. Um, whose who's idea said um, we need translations of these? Right. Um, I wonder if you could speak to some of that. Sure. So the year was 2014. It takes back nine years. Nine years. Wow. And I am at um, a general assembly, you know, not like the Westminster Assembly, but similar. I'm at a general assembly here in Grand Rapids, and I'm sitting next to a world famous scholar at the time, a man named uh, Chad Van Dixhorn, um, who published the minutes and papers of the Westminster Assembly. It's a five volume, over thousand dollar uh, work published by Oxford. It's a monument of scholarship. And for that work, uh, Chad was elected to the Royal Historical Society. Wow. And so he's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Right. And so I'm sitting next to him and I said, uh, hey, Chad, um, did you get that email I sent you, you know, six months ago or so? He said, no, I, I don't know if I did. 
I, I don't know. And then he looked in his archive and there it was. Oh, he, he blew you up. He ghosted you. He, well, he didn't mean to. Okay, all right. He, he's the nicest guy. He's twice as nice as I am. <laughs> and a third as nice as you or something like that. All right. And um, and he said, oh, yeah, here it is. And in this, I had said, you know, Chad, you're, you're a world famous scholar. You know, I really admire your work. I have a little bit of ability in Latin. Maybe we could collaborate on something. Yeah. And he said, okay, all right. He's just trying to blow me off a little bit. I yeah. Think. He says, I got this list of men who were at the Westminster Assembly. It's a long list, including their works of Latin that have never been translated. Why don't you start on this one? He's just kind of throwing me, you know. Did he, he, point, did he point to one specific one? Hey, yes. you should do this one. John Aerosmith. Okay. Uh, which I've also translated. It, it may come out this year, I'm hopeful. All right. And okay, so I wanted to impress him, right? I mean, Royal Historical Society. Come on. Right. I never made it out of Weeblos. <laughs> You know who they are? <laughs> they're one They're one cut down from the Boy Scouts, yes, the Weeblos. That's right, that's right. Yeah. I never made it out of Weeblos. All right, so... So I thought, I got to impress this guy. Yep. So I went right home, and I worked really hard, and tr translated about 25 pages. Okay. And part of my goal was to impress with speed, right? To mm -hmm. say, I can do this, right? Mm -hmm. And I sent him a little bit of uh, the Aerosmith excerpt, and he said, oh, this is good, I like it. Let's, you know, let's do something together. So we put together a list of names, one of whom was Rutherford, John Arrowsmith, the others were um, uh, Franciscus Gomaris, Anthony Tuckney, and Oliver Bowles. Yeah. These, these five guys. And then we pitched it to that university I used to work for and some other folks. We got a grant. We started in on this. Well, we got uh, John Arrowsmith done, um, talked to Kasakra, plans for holy war. But how long did that take you to do that? One? That of dedicated, focused work, I don't know, six, seven months. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, but I wasn't working very efficiently like I did with Rutherford this this well, was you a, had you were had uh, you had many other duties that's than true right. that's that's the main thing yeah um but in the in the build-up to this I started with Franciscus Junius back in 2012 and it did that in about six or eight months and then after that I did uh, Theodore Beza I translated John Calvin um, I translated some William Perkins and then I've done some things for InterVarsity where they will say uh, we have this uh, Reformation uh, Commentary on Scripture series, Reformed Commentary on Scripture series, and we need this these little excerpts translated for the editor to put together. Okay. And so I've done four volumes like that, but not the whole volume, just little bits. Gotcha. But it's probably 150 pages of work altogether. Okay. And in that, it's a hodgepodge. So for each volume, I probably translated 15 different authors. Okay. So in terms of the number of different authors I've translated, the, the, um, the number's getting pretty high because I've done little excerpts of a bunch of people. Yes, yes. And yes. that's good for me because you learn a wide range of styles and, you know, different levels of ability in Latin based and, on the now, author. Now, are all of these kind of roughly from the same era? Well, for that, it's anyone in the 16th century, really. Okay. Now, this, the Rutherford, he's in the 17th. Yes. So I've moved into the 17th. And 17th century Latin is quite different. So uh, translating Calvin or Theodore Beza or Peter Martyr Vermigli, these are guys who were thinking in Latin at a very high level mm -hmm. and uh, beautiful, beautiful Renaissance prose. Uh, complicated, gorgeous. The Latin of the 17th century is not like that. What happened? Uh, well, the standards of fluency and idiomacy declined um, precipitously. Yeah. Yeah. And so for several of these authors... You can see, including John Owen, whom I'm also working on, you can see that they're in their minds they're they're going from English into Latin. They've learned the books of grammar and composition thoroughly and well. I mean, their knowledge of Latin far surpasses mine or yours, I think. But it's not like the 16th century, where they were constantly using Latin as an actual means of communication. Gotcha. So it has okay. become primarily literary, and so it's formulaic. Uh, my good friend Joseph Tipton um, describes it as ex sanguis, bloodless. Mm. It's it's a flat, lifeless kind of Latin, and he's right. Yeah. W would you compare it, um, you know, ancient classical Greek to to Koine? I mean, that, yes. Not, like, with Koine, it's not becoming just a literary language. But, no. But but in terms of like it's flattening out. It's, yes. It's simpl simplicity. Yes, okay. I would. Although the, the only difference in that is, you know. Um, they're still talking about everyday things, everyday affairs in Koine. Yeah. But it is it has lost the some of the richness. Right. Um, that you'd find in someone like Aristophanes. Okay. For example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so working on these different authors, then all of a sudden, uh, Reformation Heritage Books, for whom I've done most of my translating, said, we want to release the collected works of Samuel Rutherford. No one has ever taken all of Samuel Rutherford and put them into one series. And so we want to do that. And the Examen Arminianisme, the one I worked on, mm -hmm. has never been put into English, and it's got to be a part of the series. So you need to get to work on that. Okay, all and right. So I said, okay, I'll do it. Okay. And... Wow. Go ahead. No, I was I was you know, according to uh, Wikipedia, which knows all. Of right. Course, um, they list uh, twenty five or so distinct works of of Mr. Sounds Ruffer. about right. Now, um, have any of those been translated into English? Well, or is this a, many of them are English. Oh, 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 of course. Yes, many of them. Okay. Um, he, so his uh, Scholastic Disputation, his Private Disputations, and the Examen Arminianisme, I think, are the the three main Latinate. Oh, okay. Works, right. and uh, my friend Joseph is working on one of those, mm -hmm. and uh, he and I are collaborating on another one. So I'm going to be going back to Rutherford at some point, but right. I'm taking a break for now. Right. So saying, <laughs> how do you how do you feel about that? Right. So I remember talking to you ab about this, um, you know, a few weeks ago. Yeah. And, and you were you were um, I think you were pleased with how it was going, but it was becoming like a bit of a grind. Oh, tremendous! Now, grind. Did, that, did that have to do fatiguing? Did that have to do with just kind of the, the sheer amount you had to do, or were you, were you banging your head against? Rutherford's Latin. It was both. It, well, okay. Right. So if I were translating Calvin, I would find it equally fatiguing the rate I was going, mm -hmm. but I would enjoy every minute of it because the quality of the Latin is so high. I see. Now, maybe Rutherford can write better Latin. I don't know. But this is highly scholastic, horribly repetitive, mm. jaw-breaking um, adverbs whose you know meaning is very hard to trace and track down sometimes we can share some of those you yeah know, if we have time in this episode um, it's just not fun right it's in some ways like reading um, a manual for how to use your lawnmower oh man oh. can you imagine oh <laughs> and 800 pages of that yeah right. <laughs> now the you know part of the saving grace is that the topics he's talking about are of genuine interest to me mm -hmm. you know the 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 nature of god the character of the trinity the workings of salvation you know the human will and its position in god's providence the sacraments all these very interesting topics to me yeah but if anything could have driven me away from loving them it would be <laughs> <laughs> the style in which it's presented. Wow. Because scholastic Latin has no charm. All right. It has no beauty. Okay, so that makes I mean that makes the translator's role even more difficult, mm. right? It's so it's if if you're saying translating Homer, right? Or you're taking this 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 beautiful masterpiece right. and you're trying to render it into English that's trying also trying to attractive. do it do it justice. Right. Yeah. So it, as a I mean so as a translator, do you say to stay true to this work, my translation has to be a bit dull. Oh, that is exactly right. That is exactly right. And, you know, so my friend Joseph, uh, Joseph A. Tipton, uh, who um, is a brilliant scholar, and uh, he's one of my go-to guys. If I get stumped on something, I take a screenshot and say, you know, I've been, I've been looking at this for an hour. I cannot figure it out what's going on. Yeah. And he'll, you know, fire back something right away and he'll say, well, you know, I think it's maybe take it like this. And he's invariably right. And he usually says, um, you got to stop staring at it for so long, you know, all work and, mo and no play. Uh, makes Homer a dull boy, yeah. right? <laughs> and uh, But he says, you know, one of his points is, don't make, be sure not to make the author sound better than he is. And in a work like this, hmm. it's hard not to do that because, you know, I'm always thinking about the reader. How is the reader going to appropriate this? Right, right. And I want them to be able to understand it. So in the 753 pages of, of English that I turned out, you know, there's a, a dozen places maybe that are highlighted that I still have to work on where I said to myself, I'm still not sure what he's saying. Mm -hmm. um, there's no lucidity in his writing. There's no clarity. Um, Philip Melanchthon from um, 16th century, he has a style that's like flowing water. It's limpid. There's never any doubt about his meaning. Yeah. And he's very much like Cicero in that respect. Right. Just so much clarity. Uh, Rutherford had trouble, I would say, achieving that in this work. Yeah, 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 yeah. That... Now, in his defense, mm -hmm. um, part of the background of the work is that it was uh, a pastiche that was stitched together from two different sources. So Rutherford had a manuscript that was unfinished in his own nearly illegible handwriting, as one of the editors of his own generation said. But then he also dictated the lecture to his students at St. Mary's College. And one of his students took down very copious notes in Latin 
uh, in response to Rutherford's lectures. Okay. Then a third guy, a Dutchman, Matthias Nethen, compared the two sources and put them together into the final work from which I translated. So that becomes kind of the canonical text. That's it, right. right. Okay. Now, I don't really know how much of this is um, Nethen himself looking at the two sources and trying to make it a connected whole. Yeah. And it's interesting because um, the Latin version of the name Jacob, you know, the biblical character, Esau's brother, is Jacobus, right? J-A-C-O-B-U-S. Mm -hmm. But at several points in the text, we're given the Dutch spelling of uh, Jacobus, which has a K in it, mm. and is sometimes two A's, right? And uh, that's interesting because that, to me, is a hint that uh, Nathan, the Dutchman here, maybe was supplying a few things. He's messing with it. Right, because yeah. I, can't, I can't imagine, I could be wrong about this, but mm -hmm. I can't imagine uh, Rutherford using a Dutch spelling of the name Jacob. Why, right. why would he do that? Did your work uh, involve you going to... to Look at the original manuscripts or the earliest manuscripts to kind of to try to figure of some this? Of, of this out, or were you? Well, I, I have the only manuscript. Um, there's there's one there's one edition that was, you know, photocopied several different times. The the E E B O Early English Books Online. So I have a PDF of that. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of other PDFs. One from one from Amsterdam. Uh, I think one from Utrecht. But they're basically all the same book. Okay. It was just digitized uh, differently. And at one point, I think it was page. 575, I'm pretty sure. I can't connect the two pages. I'm thinking, what is he saying at the bottom of this page? This doesn't make any sense. Now, maybe it was late at night or early in the morning. And then I realized there's four pages missing from that edition. Oh, gosh. So I spent way too long trying to figure out what's going on here. So you're working You're working from these PDFs. Yeah. Which are in, in they're handwritten. No, 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 no. Oh, it's, it's a printed text. It's a printed text. Okay, okay. Yes. All right. But... Um, but Rutherford had his handwritten edition, then the student's notes. Okay, okay. And then Matthias Nethen put He's the two the together. together. Gotcha, all right. And, and that's, that's a, the one I that's have. That's the printed text. Correct. Okay, gotcha. It's 800 and, uh, count, not counting indices, it's 812 pages. Okay. Now, the pages are small, right? And uh, there's not a lot of text on each one. So I had to set myself a certain goal per day. I needed to average eight pages per day in order to finish in my deadline because... Uh, someone had done some heel dragging because of the uh, many other responsibilities. <laughs> and so when it got to late October of the previous year, I um, I said, well, I better get this done because uh, I made this promise and uh, I'm kind of late. Yeah. So I charted out a, you know, a course. I need to get this much done per day. Yeah. yeah and yeah. that was the fatigue you were noticing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, I wonder if you could talk about, to get really specific, if right. you could talk about like some specific Latin words or as a, a phrase or um, a, yes. a paragraph that kind of drove you crazy or. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. What, what? Oh, I can. Okay. <laughs> Lay it on us. So I was making a document as I went along. I gave you a copy of that there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in preparation for a translator's introduction. Because Dr. Van Dixhorn, of course, you know, he'll, he'll work on this. Uh, he's a great scholar. Uh, but we need to have a translator's introduction. And so I started making a list of um, words that I found difficult or, uh, you know, hard to define, hard to, hard to use. And here's a list just of adverbs. So formaliter, which you could translate as formally, yeah. right? But um, it formally doesn't mean the same thing then as it does now, right? Formally now has to do not with the form of something, but with a certain sense of um, politeness, right? So you wouldn't mm. use formally in the same way today as you would then. Yeah. So yeah, I had yeah. to make a lot of those kinds of decisions. Okay, okay. That's a pretty easy one. There's, there's materialitaire, no problem. Essentialitaire, essentially, maybe. Ministerialitaire, not too bad. Reductive. Spiritualitaire, perspicue, these are ones mostly I've seen before. Mm -hmm. But if we get down to reduplicative, right, these are all highly scholastic adverbs. And Rutherford had done his homework. So he knew Thomas Aquinas. He knew the Jesuits like Banyas and uh, Ruiz. He knew um, so many of his uh, Jesuit contemporaries and, mm. and uh, older contemporaries, uh, the Bellarmine. Uh, the Jesuit Bellarmine, who was a very famous Roman Catholic scholar, he's using, quoting, and referencing their works, and um, thus, this is where all of that vocabulary comes from. Okay. Indeclinabilitaire, which I first took as unswervingly. Yeah. Indeclinably doesn't 
doesn't mean anything. Right. <laughs> Undeviatingly, it was it was really difficult. Man, oh man. And then there are scholastic terms like infieri, which like which means uh, in the process of becoming, mm-hmm. in facto esse, right? Um, which means um, existing in a finished state. But when you're translating, you don't want to give long definitions for things. You want to find precise ways of referring to the same idea each time. Right, 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 right. And that's where the big challenge comes in. So some of the some of these phrases you had encountered in your other translations. Yes. Um, but many, Ruth- many Rutherford were new. Rutherford, some of these new ones were right. Were, caused you some. Yes. Some. Uh, so one trick harm. is that uh, I would just go look to see whether. The persons with whom he's interacting, Aquinas, Domingo Banez, and um, some of the others, uh, who is Gregory de Dominis, if there are English translations of their works. Yes. And then I could see how have other scholars yeah. taken these particular terms. And so I found some places uh, where Aquinas, you know, from reputable translations, the same word as it's used in Aquinas, here it's being used by Rutherford in what I take to be a similar context. And then I'll just use that term, yeah, because yeah. it has already been established as a term of art, right, right, right. right. But that only gets you go gets you so far because yeah. there's just so much of it. And that's, I mean, I imagine that's a bit of a headache of um, lots of searching. I mean, digitally, I guess it's these things are, are fairly easy to find, but even so, yes, it's tedious. It's tedious, and yeah. this was before Chat GPT, right? We could just do it for you, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't think so. And then you know he uses uh, different words like Romanenses. Pontificii and papistae, right? So papistae is a pejorative term for a papist, mm. but Romanenses and pontificii are more descriptive terms of Roman Catholics. And uh, this is one of the reasons why there are so many footnotes. At this point, there's 2,900 footnotes. Um, eventually, that'll probably be cut down by a third, because a lot of the footnotes now are just notes to myself. Ah. So if I encounter a particular Latin word on page five, I take a note of it because when I get to page 405, I don't want to have to rethink it or translate it in an entirely different way. Right. Because I want to retain um, standard terminology yeah. as much as possible. Exactly. But once I've decided, okay, this is what I'm going to go with, then I can go back and delete it because yeah. it doesn't mean anything to the reader, right? It's just a note to the translator. Yeah. Now, do, do you happen to know um, his his famous letters aside? Right. In English, is he as kind of stiff as he I don't he know. You, have you, have you, have you I looked haven't at those? read much of his English or really any that I can think of. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I could speak about John Owen, another famous scholar from that era. His Latin is Byzantine and uh, bloodless and Rococo. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how his English is too. Hmm. So I, I think, I expect Rutherford to be the same in English as he was in Latin, but I can't say. A lot of this is genre, right? It's the scholastic genre. Yeah. But the mark of a of a great author is to be able to write in different genres. Yes, yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Now I have a question about like even approaching a work like this. Mm-hmm. Do you do say I, I got to get a feel for who this guy was? You re, you do some biography work, kind of get a sense of his place in history, or yes. do you, or do you just dive right in? No, I do that, but honestly, it's somewhat stalling. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I I gather up a bibliography. These are the works I'm going to read. So mm-hmm. I read the sturdy book. I'm I'm reading the sturdy book. I read the Guy Richard. I read the John Coffee. So this is it's you're, a little bit of stalling. You're just kind of just, put, you're putting up the exactly. End of the book. <laughs> Come on, buckle down and do something. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. But yeah. the the goal is that the initial work would not be uh, too uh, fruitless and frustrating or need to be redone, right? Because I want to become familiar with the setting as much as possible Mm -hmm. so that the initial stages are, you know, easier. Yeah. By the time I got deep into it, okay, I learned the rhythm. I know what I'm doing now. Uh, but the first part was, you know, it was hard going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hard going. Say a little bit about you know, the subject of the work. That what I mean, what is Arminianism? Right. I mean, what's he What's he dealing with? Right. So examen, right, is the the noun head there. It's a third declension neuter. It means an examination or a review. It can also mean a censure or a critique. Uh, so the working title is careful review because I think that captures examen. But you know, the publisher may decide we need to go with something else. Oh, you don't you don't have final cut there? You no. Can't, you, no. Do you think I have final cut? <laughs> well, I thought you know, I, you'd have some influence over what the title well, would well, be. Well, I'm going to make a big argument. Okay. I'm going to raise a big stink, but I don't think I have the final say. Okay. Arminianism is a system of thought named after Jacob Arminius, uh, one of your countrymen, a Dutchman, Jacob Harmansoon. Yeah. Uh, 1560 to 1609. So he died in 1609, 
uh, in the Netherlands, and he wrote a work called The Anti-Perkins, which was against William Perkins. And William Perkins is that uh, English Calvinist. Mm -hmm. And what really happened is that uh, Arminius was the leader of a number of men in the Netherlands who began to disagree with the Calvinist view of soteriology, uh, the view popularized by John Calvin, William Perkins, like I just mentioned, um, Ursinus and um, Beza and others. And it has to do with uh, the freedom of God in the salvation of individuals, um, you know, to eternal life. But predestination. Correct. Okay, right. And Arminius <clears throat> was quite upset about some of the uh, tendencies, as he saw, the, the uh, unbiblical tendencies of the Calvinist system. And he began to write against it and to object. He died in 1609 before the controversy reached its boiling head, which was 1618 at the Synod of Dort. Okay. But he had uh, two followers um, and many others who adopted his thought who came to be called the Remonstrants uh, because they issued to the Dutch government a remonstrance saying, here are the points at which uh, we think university teaching and the teaching in the churches should change because the Calvinists are wrong about some of their views on um, salvation. Okay. One of the men was a man named Simon Episcopius, a Dutchman. He died in 1643. He is one of Rutherford's favorite targets. So he will quote uh, Episcopius all the time. Uh, another one was a man named Valentinus Smalkius. And Smalkius was a German and he was a Socinian theologian. Now, a Socinian is a follower, it's a complicated story, of uh, an Italian humanist named Faustus Socinus. And Faustus Socinus, or um, Socini, his Italian name, uh, denied the Trinity. So mm. he was an anti Trinitarian and uh, labeled a heretic. Um, but his thought continued on and was popular in some circles, especially with this guy, Smalkius. So part of Rutherford's point is to show that the Arminians and the Remonstrants, these are the Dutch guys uh, in the Netherlands responding to Calvin, mm -hmm. they are verging dangerously close to and are indistinguishable from Socinus and other anti-Trinitarian okay. heresies. Okay, all right, all right. So he will often quote in his writing, he will say, uh, he'll ask a question. This is how the form of the word uh, works. Quiratur, question, it is asked, or here's the question, right? Mm -hmm. Then he will lay out a question, which is usually a quote from one of his opponents, and then he will say, the remonstrants affirm this. So, remonstrates I unt, right? They say that this is true. Mm -hmm. Then he'll quote from Smalchius or Episcopius, from Arminius himself, uh, from a guy named Corvinus, or from uh, Dumoulin, one of these other scholars, and he'll quote directly, this is what they thought. Then he will say, nos negamos. We deny it. Mm. Right? So, remonstrantes iunt, the remonstrants affirm it. This is standard scholastic language, nos negamos. We deny it. And then he will have 12 points, each of which begins with a quia. Right? We deny this because, because, because. Mm. And in the course of giving all of those points, he will often cite um, scriptural exegesis. Okay. Uh, we deny this because, and then he'll give a scripture quotation, and then he'll exegete it, and he'll pull out the implications uh, of each one of these um, passages. And here he's brilliant. I mean, I wish that he had had time, um, you know, to publish it himself, that it wasn't a posthumous publication. Yeah. In 1668, seven years after his death. I wish that he had time to work on the style a little bit if he cared. It, yeah, I mean, cause it sounds like a detailed outline. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah. it is a detailed outline. Right. That's that's partly just the you know the style of scholasticism. Right. But there's no charm. He does. He doesn't no get humor. He doesn't get salty like some of these guys can. With he each does other. occasionally, okay. but I mean it it it's so rare that in 753 pages, it's hard for me to even remember a couple of them. I think hmm. we should read a few samples. Okay. Uh, here and there, but um, it, this is the kind of thing that, in hindsight, I'm going to really enjoy. You know that I did it. Yes. Right. Uh, Cicero has this phrase, something like um, "Memoria dolorum praeteritorum uh, nobis delectationem praestat." The memory of past sorrows brings us pleasure. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be like that. Gotcha. I'm going to look back and say, you know, that torture was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, you know, it's uh, it was just hard slogging mm -hmm. because the Latin is so poor. Right. Honestly, you want to give us a couple examples? Yeah. 
I'd like to just briefly give a, an outline of the structure of the work, mm -hmm. if that's okay, and then I'll read some actual quotes. Okay. So it's got uh, divided up into 20 chapters. And uh, chapter one, the sacred scriptures and their content. Chapter two is on God, divided up into five sections. Then there's election, reprobation, the state of the first man, original sin, the state of fallen man, state of grace, universal redemption, so on and so forth, and ends up with chapter 20, the soul and the resurrection of the body. One thing that happened that as I went through the work, with a couple of exceptions, the chapters tended to get smaller. Hmm. They weren't nearly as long, right? Or they got shorter. So I'm kind of wondering if he's starting to run out of steam a little bit. Yeah. Or if it's just dictated by the nature of the argument itself. It's not really clear to me. Uh, the one on the process of conversion, chapter 11, was very long, as was the sinner's justification. Uh, and the magistrate, chapter 19, you know, civil government, that was pretty long. Um, but the one on synods was relatively short, hmm. uh, a later one. So one of the things I learned is that, um, you know, coming to this without a whole lot of previous knowledge, I understood the Arminian debate about the nature of election, right? So the basic idea is that uh, Calvin and the Reformed believe uh, God chooses in advance who's going to be saved. Mm -hmm. And the Arminian position is God sees in advance who is going to choose him and on that basis chooses them. I see. Okay. So you walk into a room, right? And God says, I choose you, you, and you, right? That's kind of a very basic, poor example of the Reformed view. Mm -hmm. um, the Armenian view is God walks into a room and says, who wants to be on my team? Those who raise their hand, he then chooses because his, his will is conditioned on their desire to choose him. Gotcha. Okay. That, that's a right. basic sketch. Okay. Okay. So I thought that was really the extent of the difference between Arminians and the Reformed on a number of issues. Mm -hmm. But in the course of 20 chapters, there's a whole raft of other issues. Uh, and this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, Rutherford brought all this out. Okay. A deep, deep disagreement on any number of issues. Wow. Okay. Okay. So this is from uh, page 194. This thing just doesn't matter that much because the page numbers will change. But it's uh, from the third section of the first chapter, which is on the Trinity. So he begins with a quote, Philippians 2, 6, who, referring to Christ, although he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So these biblical verses stated, and then, of course, that's the easy part to translate. <laughs> then, uh, then Rutherford says, question, is Christ true God, homoousios, and consubstantial with the Father, according to the Arminians' thinking. Some of them make that verbal claim, but in reality they deny it. And for that reason, we consider them, with full justification, as highly suspected of Arianism. Mm. So this is a standard course of operation. Here's what they say, mm -hmm. but here's what they say elsewhere. See the inconsistency, Rutherford says, and we consider them, therefore, suspect of a more serious... Um, flaw or heresy, that of the Arian heresy. Which would be anti-Trinitarian. That's correct. Yeah, exactly. okay. So then he begins, point one. The most celebrated professors of Leiden censure the remonstrance because in their own confession, which should contain their substantial points of doctrine and fundamental articles of the faith, they refrain from using the terms homoousios and consubstantial. So he quotes another one of his allies. These would be the professors at the University of Leiden, uh, who were Reformed and, in Rutherford's view, Orthodox. Okay. In their apology, they make no reply, but merely say, quote, they do not wish to pronounce anathema on those who take a wrong position on the Trinity and on the persons of the Son and Holy Spirit. They say, quote, the ancient church kept communion with those who believed that Jesus Christ did not exist except as a man from men. So I never would have guessed, based on my limited knowledge of the Arminians, that um, Rutherford's going to take him to task for yeah. bad Christology. Hmm. They they are so concerned about um, church unity, you might say. Yeah, they're unwilling to condemn someone with a an Arian position. All right, Dave. So before we get out of here, about one more example. Yes. Okay. So this is from uh, the fifth section of that same chapter on God, and it's at the bottom of page two forty two. Question: Does God have sufficient control over free acts because He created and preserves the will? grants it its power, and cooperates with it. So, does God have control over the will because he gave the will absolute control and a free power of controlling that is unqualified by God's predetermination over free acts? <laughs> Got it? <laughs> the Jesuits affirm this. 
C. Fagiolo in his commentary on Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, also Ruiz on Thomas. He is not complete master of his estate who cannot grant its control and use to another actor. Thus Ruiz in his work Knowledge of God, also Raymond in his work Moral Disciplines, note as well uh, Giles de Conic, Nicholas Grenkinghoven, and other remonstrants. But we maintain, so here's Rutherford, we maintain that it is consistent with God that his control has no power over the will and its free acts unless that control be from God. Not only no power over the fact that it is a will, but also that it acts or does not act, and that it is within the purview of God's control that a free act exists in a certain instance rather than not exist, that there are a precise number of free acts, nor more, nor fewer. This is because, and then he goes through his long list of arguments all his quias yes that's okay. right all right wow. and that's not a particularly dense example honestly <laughs> wow, man. of his argumentation oh my gosh so it's uh it's tough yeah it's tough my goodness yep yeah. so that's what uh you know that's what's been occupying me and we could talk more about how to use dictionaries how to track things down online yeah. the other kinds of tricks and tools you know that i use to try to keep everything um in order i'm just very grateful that i get to work on this yeah and, Hopefully, I'll you know, see it to publication in the next to, couple of years. To revisit it once it's once yeah. it's out. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Got the book in hand, and you know, acknowledge uh, Jeff Winkle, who's you know, uh, humor and uh, good spirits, and all of the podcasting, you know, sustained me through this. Oh, so. I, excellent! Yeah, I look forward to seeing my name on that dedication page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, in the acknowledgments, come on, I'm going to dedicate it oh, to that's you. Right. That's, that's it. Let's yeah, not yeah. go crazy. All right. Hey, we got to get out of here. Yeah, though. we do. Yep. So um, who do we have to thank? We need to thank Mishka, yes. our sound engineer, who puts this together so nicely each week. Mm -hmm. Scott Vinzen and Ken Tamplin for the music you hear throughout the episode. Um, I can't say enough about those guys. Yeah. Talent. Generous, talented. Yep. yep. What if they want to get a t-shirt, Jeff? Well, they should go to adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Get yourself a uh, Quinocent Dokent t-shirt. Uh, right. um, if you want to write to us, if you want a shout out. Uh, you can write to Dave, Dave at adnauseum.com or Jeff at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V there in ad nauseum. That's right. A-D-N-A-V-S-E-A-M. I've got some online teaching with the Greeks and the Latins. Got mossmethod.com, latinperdiem.com slash LLPSI. Uh, you want to do this kind of thing? I can teach you. I can take you from little or no knowledge, from neophyte to erudite. That's my plan. Mm -hmm. So check it out, please. We would really appreciate that. Next week, Jeff, what are we going to do? Back to the Aeneid? I think so. Book 10. Book 10, yeah. We're on the, uh, on the downslope here. We are. Home stretch. Yes, declivity. Yeah, and I believe, Dave, you have our gustatory parting shot. I do, if I can just find it here in my stack of items. Here we go. Uh, this one has comic potential, I would say, <laughs> although it's not inherently funny. But okay. let's see what we can do it. What do we got? This is from one Clarissa Dixon Wright. And she says, incidentally... Although the Cistercians did much to improve the quality of sheep. Hmm. Did you know that? Oh, I'm, uh, the Cistercians were famous right. for, for this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Although the Cistercians did much to improve the quality of sheep, the animal remained much smaller than its modern descendants. As late as the early 18th century, a sheep wasn't much bulkier than a Labrador dog. Did you know that? I had no idea. Isn't that fascinating? It is fascinating. So yeah. now, you know, are you hungry for some Labrador or I'm, lamb I'm chop? I'm over some lamb. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks for listening. Thanks everybody. for listening.